So keep your eyes open for that. Um, we have our speakers. I will be preaching next week. My current plan is to preach on Psalm 19. So if you want to read ahead, um, go ahead. There's no guarantee I won't change my mind in the next week or so, but that is my current plan. Um, then we have the Nineno Needs coming the week after that. And then you can see the rest there. Bethany Family Camp is this week. Pray for those that will be going there, that they will have a good time of enjoyment, relaxation, and growing in the Lord. Um, the 30th, which would be, that's this Saturday, you have a graduation party for David Gard at their house here in Ripley on Goodrich Street from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. And then be praying for the Backyard Bible Club that will be starting up at the end of August um, for those young children, for both workers and for the children. Um, are there any other announcements that we need to know about that I don't know about? All right, I'll start us. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have come today. Uh, be with us as we fellowship together. We're so glad we have the freedom to do that. Um, be with us as we raise our voices in worship. Help our draw our hearts closer to you. Uh, give us a spirit of repentance as well during this time. And uh, bless Sandra as she presents her missionary to Peru with us. And we thank you for your word and the ability to study it. Uh, please bless those who are here and those who cannot be here. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up your hymnals to 44. Hymn number 44, Be Thou Exalted. Be thou exalted forever and ever, God of eternity, the ancient of days. Wondrous in majesty, so mighty in wisdom, perfect in holiness and worthy of praise. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Be thou exalted, O Son of the Highest, Gracious Redeemer, our Savior and King, One with the Father, co-equal in glory, here at thy footstool our homage we bring. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Be thou exalted, O Spirit eternal. Dwell in our hearts, keep us holy within. Feed us each day with thy heavenly manna. Healer of wounded hearts, thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture 
rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. I need scriptures, I guess. Here we have uh, one verse that Sandy will be using later today as well, and we're going to read that verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. It's a strong statement. That's good to be reminded that He's faithful. We're doing something special this morning that is not on the bull. We're having two people come and give their testimony. Um, pardon? Ton and Travis Bensink are going to come up, and Ton will be first. And then uh, after they're done, the members are going to vote on them. Just so you know, the deacons have already heard them and will bring them up as for a vote. Uh, we're allowed to do that vote anytime as long as we're in a service like this or a business meeting. It doesn't matter. So we're going to do this this morning because this is the easiest time to get it done. So come on up. And uh, I thought it, I think it would be good for you to hear their testimony. Good morning. start off with a drink of water <laughs> okay um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about where I came from um, as a child but also kind of our journey to becoming Christians I was raised by loving parents Daryl and Sue who you've met um, I was given opportunities to attend Awana um, with friends as a child and then I also was able to go to youth group um, with some other friends in my high school years I did not practice or live a Christian life, but I did believe in God. But I didn't really understand my need for any type of repentance. So I would say it was very surface level, just um, believing that God excuse me, believing that God existed. Um, Luke 5, 31 and 32 tells us it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I did not know just how sick I was. In my early 20s, I spent many weekends and weeknights partying with our friends. I slowly be began to feel the burden of that lifestyle, and the weight was really heavy. I felt very empty. I wasn't able to, to conceive children, and alcohol was destroying my health, our finances, and my marriage. I needed a change, and I felt pulled to find purpose in my life. I decided I would finish my master's degree in counseling, and that would lead to a rewarding career. A career is what I thought would fill this emptiness and heal my sickness. I achieved my goal and I started my career. I was working in mobile therapy providing mental health counseling for children in Warren County. It was really difficult, but it was rewarding. It was through this employment that I met a coworker and her name was Courtney. Courtney was a Christian and her worldview was very different from mine. I wasn't at that time looking for a friend. I was just looking for hope and I was asking her questions regularly about her faith. God used Courtney first to soften my heart. Then he provided an opportunity for me to attend church with her. She invited Travis and I to attend a church service over in Jamestown with her and her husband. It was April 7, 2007. I was approximately 27 years old. On the way to the service, Travis was interrogating our new friends. He was asking many, many questions, and he was relentless. Our new friends were so patient. They provided so many answers from the Bible about things that we had misconceptions about, about our beliefs, about what we thought God was like. Again, God was preparing our hearts. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. On this day, I could see that all the plans that I had for myself had not yielded the result I had hoped for. Just as the service began, my heart was really heavy with the weight of my sin. 
I prayed God would help me to pay attention and to listen. The preacher began his message, and for the first time, my eyes were seeing and my ears were hearing the good news. This particular sermon seemed to answer nearly every question Travis had fired at our new friends in the car ride over. I sat in awe. How could this be? There wasn't time for the preacher to know that we needed answers to these questions. Our friends didn't know the preacher and didn't contact him ahead of time. The only logical answer was God. Only God could have done that. He was who the Bible said he was. That also meant that he had sent his son Jesus to die for all sin. Not just everyone's sin, but specifically my sin. Jesus died for my sin, and then I realized I was a sinner. We all know John 3, 16, and at that time it was probably the only scripture verse I could quote. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I believed at that moment. I knew this to be true. I prayed to Jesus and asked him to forgive me. I was a sinner. I knew I didn't deserve to be forgiven, but I understand my need to be forgiven. That day I was saved, April 7, 2007. I understood that I was a sinner, the punishment for which was death. Jesus paid my price when he died on the cross and was resurrected. Salvation was a free gift, wasn't anything I could earn, and by God's grace alone, through my faith, I was saved. Shortly after we were saved, we ended up moving to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and from there, Travis and I were baptized on October 18, 2009, at a church called Twin City Bible Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Since then, God blessed us with four children, um, so my infertility was cured, so to speak, <laughs> um, and those four children now attend here with us, Tatum, Thandon, Talia, and Tripp. So I'll let Travis tell his testimony, but we're so grateful to be here. Uh, we moved back from North Carolina in 2014, and we um, attended church in a different church for quite, a, quite some time, um, but God led us here, so we're glad to be here at Ripley. You're going to hear a lot of similarities. <laughs> I'll give you a little background about myself. I grew up in a church family, as you'd say. I heard the gospel growing up, but readily rejected it um, as I was growing up. Um, before I came to Christ, I, was, I felt as if I was stumbling from one sinful decision to another. I was a drinker. I was a smoker. I was the life of the party. People always wanted me to be there. I was constantly looking for one selfish act that I could dive into head first after another. Then my wife and I met our friends, Aaron and Courtney, who had already been found by Christ. When we were around them, I couldn't wait to leave so we could go to the next social gathering, whether it be a bar or out with friends at their house or to a party. One evening, they asked if we wanted to go to church with them, and I begrudgingly agreed. On the car ride there, I had plenty of, of questions as to why they believed certain things in the Bible that I was grown up learning. What was tithing? Why did they do it? What did it mean to live a Christ-like life? Questions poured out of my mouth. Little did I know that all my questions would soon be answered. While listening to the sermon, the preacher started answering all my questions without being prompted to do so. Actually, even quoting, this is not the sermon I planned on giving. <coughs> One after another, my questions fell out of his mouth, answered. I immediately felt called by God. First Thessalonians 4 through 6. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that, we, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. He opened my eyes that moment, showing me loud and clear how I was a sinner. At that moment, God found me in that little church in the middle of nowhere. I believe the gospel and ask Christ to forgive me of my sin. Since I have come to Christ, I no longer am a drinker, I don't smoke, not the life of the party. 
In my day-to-day -day life, when people ask me why I'm so happy, I reply, God is with me. After receiving Christ in April 2007, I was baptized on October 19, 2009. When given the opportunity, I share my testimony and try to help other people find the same feeling I felt that day, every day. God has blessed my wife and I with four amazing kids since being saved. He has charged us with examples of being examples to them and teaching them the gospel, Joshua 24:15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. With this scripture in mind, God has continued to lead me with his blessings and help me grow every day. I now wake up every day a sinner, an unworthy recipient of God's grace and mercy. I strive to live my life as an example of Christ would want me to be. I pray daily the Paul, that Paul's word, words in Philippians are prophetic in my life. And I am sure of this, Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. So the... Deacons have uh, all gotten together with them. We agree that they should be brought up for membership, so we technically do that with a uh, the question of would you, uh, I guess I should ask you for the question, but I'll just say, we would say, um, we would be delighted to put it to a vote, and we believe they would make good members of our church, and they believe in Jesus Christ, and they agree with our Constitution. So, only members can vote on this. Um, so, we'll have you just raise your hand. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed? <laughs> That's all right. Her daughter back there didn't put her hand down. She just kept it up there for both. That was perfect. Um, so, uh, we just extend you the right hand of fellowship today, and they'll be out back for you all to welcome into the family. Thank you. Thank you. All right, turn your hymn books then to hymn number 663. Uh, we're going to sing the first. Well, we're going to sing the second verse of the song. Second verse of the song. And uh, that's all today. We're just the second verse. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove. True every moment you live, make me a blessing, make me a blessing all of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, oh, say. sing our worship songs this morning. We're going to start with Behold Our God. to rejoice. Be 
behold our God seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore To the Lord, who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God. Seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come let us adore him. Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less 
and Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil trumpet sound who oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne Christ alone cornerstone we may strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, we may strong in the Savior's love. song, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Oh God, how I need you. 
teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for new people you bring into your fold and who come to worship with us. We're grateful for Travis and Ton and their desire to be a part of this church. We praise you for your love for us. We thank you that we can worship you in songs, and we appreciate today that we can hear from a missionary on what's going on, somebody who serves you in another field. We just are so thankful for that. We pray for Sandy as she shares, and for us as we hear, in Christ's name, amen. Those ages three to five may be dismissed. No, it's three to five. Three to five. And six to nine have notebooks up here. So as you can see on the board, Sandy Himes here. We have appreciate her fellowship in our family. And it was Claude's oldest daughter. Some of you know that. Most of you probably do. So she's coming to share this morning. Okay, well, it is good to be with you this morning. And for some of you, what I'll be sharing today uh, includes things that you've known for a long time. But for others, it may be new. And I'm just really thankful uh, to be able to say that on March 9th of this past year, well, this year, but earlier this year, <laughs> I was able to celebrate 50 years from the day that my husband and I arrived in Peru as full-time missionaries. We had been there short-term before uh, for a period of weeks or months to help out in short-term ministries, but <clears throat> I've now been there for a little over 50 years. And one thing that I would like to say as a result of that and the experience that God has given there is that God has been faithful. One of my favorite songs is John Moore's Find Us Faithful, and it begins, We're pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary. There lies a stirring testimony of God's sustaining grace. And here are some people that you know and love, but I'm thankful for the heritage of parents who loved the Lord and who served him faithful to the very end. My dad in his 90s was still memorizing scripture, the highlight of his week, even though he wasn't mobile and could go out and around as much as he would have liked, was when, when someone came to his home to be discipled, I remember at times. I remember my mother with her dementia and many things that she couldn't remember being, uh, if we would ask, sing songs, sing hymns, she could sing with us. If we would ask her to pray, she would, and she usually prayed for us as her children. And I've had the experience of sitting by her side as she prayed for her daughter, who was a missionary in Peru, not knowing I was her daughter, who was a missionary in Peru. And yet, even to the end, 
she was able to maintain that relationship with God, to know that he is faithful, to know that she could go to him, and to know that she could talk with him. The chorus of that song presents us with a tremendous challenge. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footsteps that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. But this path to faithfulness begins with recognizing that God is faithful. As Tom read earlier, 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we have doubts and fears, when we're not sure what the future may hold, when things may seem uncertain or changed and we face different and new challenges, um, we know that he is the one who does the work and that we can rest in him and that we can trust and be thankful for the ways that he can use us and use our lives. It's interesting to me to read the story of Nehemiah that when Nehemiah had to leave Jerusalem to go back to Persia and he was looking for someone to take his place. But what characteristics was he looking for in that person? And Nehemiah 7.2 tells us that he based his choice on the fact that the one who was chosen was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. He didn't have to have a degree in theology. He didn't have to have uh, certain special skills or qualities. The main thing he was looking for was someone who was faithful and God-fearing to carry on the ministry in which he had been involved. And that to me says that as God uses us to invest in the lives of others, that's one of the main things we want to look for, is someone who wants to be faithful, someone who fears God and has a close relationship with God. Um, to give you an idea of the things that I am involved in, I currently have the privilege of serving in three main areas of ministry. In the local church, in our seminary, training uh, leaders for the national church there, and also ministering to women and families through the New Life Prenatal Center. My foundational ministry has always been within the local church, although the specific ministries have varied over the years. I was a lot more involved in children's ministries for many years, but lately has been especially with women. And one of the most effective ministries there has been uh, in the, the church I'm involved in now has been our weekly ladies' Bible study. Gradually, we've been able to transition from myself doing all the teaching or just one or two of us to the point that we now have several women who are sharing in that responsibility. This year, we're studying 10 different women of the Bible, and we have, have eight different women who are each taking a month to, uh, to be leading those studies as far as the teaching. I do still... Um, teach several weeks out of the year. We kind of alternate between studying a book of the Bible, emphasizing some aspect of spiritual growth, sometimes and that's something related to home and the family. But uh, this year I will actually only be teaching four or five weeks. Part of it because I'm gone, but also because I, I work some with the newer teachers. If they need help, some of them really don't need help anymore. And uh, during this time of transition, I think I would say that more and more I have been become and more involved in the area of personal discipleship with different women there in the church. I believe that God wants each of us to walk alongside others on their spiritual journey, helping them to hear God's voice, to dig deeply into his word, to speak openly and honestly with him in prayer, and to serve him with a willing and humble heart. Some of these women are brand new believers and they need guidance on those first steps in their spiritual journey. And we've had others who have been believers for many years, but they were in a church where they had never been discipled or where they didn't really get in-depth good Bible teaching. And so even though they have known the Lord for many years, uh, they really also need to grow in Him. Maribel accepted the Lord when she was still a child, and as a teenager, she was active in a local church that had a good youth group. She was encouraged to read her Bible, to pray, to grow in her spiritual life, and she married a believer, but they moved to another part of the city, and gradually, just the busyness of her life, she was caring for her home and family, involved in the school that her children attended, and she worked in their family business. And gradually that busyness just took over her days. They often went to church on Sunday morning, 
but um, her Bible reading and prayer were kind of uh, exchanged for helping with homework, watching TV with her husband at night to just relax from everything that went on in the day. And she realized, especially after her father died, um, that she had that real desire to once again have a close walk with God. So since she was in a family business, she was mm -hmm. able to arrange her schedule to come to Our Lady's Bible study. And then she also went through a, a basic discipleship course that we're using at the church there. And when we studied about service, she really wanted to serve the Lord in some way. And she said, I think I would really like to disciple someone else. Uh, I've learned a lot about the Bible. I've had many experiences, good and bad, that could help me to do that. But who, who could I disciple? And after our summer break, from our ladies' Bible study, she decided that she would uh, approach the women at her discussion table and offer to disciple one of them if they were interested. And when she did that, to her surprise, five ladies said, yes, please disciple me. <laughs> so it was more than what she had bargained for. But um, God used her in that relationship. And along the way, one of the ladies realized that she was not even a, really a believer. And so she, she had the privilege of leading that woman to Christ She's become an important um, part now of the Women's Ministries leadership team. And also uh, this year for the first time, uh, just two months ago, I guess it would have been, she taught for the first time. We were still teaching online at that time and that was new for her to have to not only teach but to teach online. Uh, but God used her. She taught for four weeks about uh, the life of Rahab. God's grace within Rahab's life, how he not only used her to provide a ref refuge for those Israeli spies and to save her own family, but also transformed Rahab's life and even made her a part of the genealogy of Jesus. Sometimes I feel like a proud mama who watches her children try new things. There are days when I cry with them over the bumps and the bruises, days when we get on our knees together to ask the Lord for guidance and to help us uh, to know just what to do in certain circumstances, but there are also many days when we can rejoice together as they experience God's grace and enabling, especially as they step out to try something new. Hopefully when I return to Lima in August, we'll be able to start again with the training classes in evangelism and discipleship. These pictures are from before the pandemic because we haven't been able to meet in this type of group situation for over two years. but. Um, the a smaller group of the ladies stayed after the ladies' Bible study for another hour each week to learn how to use the story of hope. Uh, there's a copy both in English and Spanish on the back table, but it's a chronological Bible study. It takes us through 20 events from the Old Testament, 20 from the New Testament, and basically gives a really panoramic view of the Bible and of God's big redemptive story. One of the women who stayed for that study was Medium. As a child, she'd heard a little bit about the gospel in her small village up high in the Andes. And then as an adult in Lima, in the midst of a family crisis, she went and looked for an evangelical church. She made a profession of faith there, but it was a church that was based mostly on emotionalism. And she really did not get into the Bible. She knew very little about God's word. And so as she went through our basic discipleship uh, with Elsa, the woman in the middle is another woman who does quite a bit of our personal discipleship, she decided that she wanted to learn how to better and more completely share her faith with others. So she did enroll in the Story of Hope class and also then went on to another uh, mm. Way to Joy, which is a basic discipleship program that can be used. But on along the way, as we discussed the meaning of baptism, she and her teenage, two teenage children took that step of faith. And I'm glad to say that within the last year and a half, I think it's been about a year and a half ago, her husband has now accepted the Lord. And right now he's being discipled by one of the men from church. And we're hoping to have our first baptism uh, within the next few months. And he plans to be among one of those. So we're glad that he's now obeying the Lord in that way. But Medium works in a, a feeding program for poor children in a police station not too far from her home. And so she bought a set of the Bible visuals that we had been using for the Story of Hope. And she began to teach um, a Bible lesson each week to these children. And then there is a policeman there 
who is a believer, and he came to her and he said, would you please teach the mothers of these children? They need this more than the children. <laughs> and so um, they began to do that as well. Two of the other ladies from the Bible study went with her and helped her. And they have also been working with these women there um, in this more outside area of Lima, but it's an outreach that she was able to use, the things that she had learned in that way. A second general area of ministry would be within our local seminary, which is a real opportunity to train leaders. Before his death in 2011, Neil's ministry had focused more and more on training leaders for the developing national church. And within the seminary there, students can work toward a one-year discipleship certificate or a three-year diploma in pastoral mm -hmm. studies, biblical counseling, Christian education, or biblical studies. And then with two additional years, most college programs in Peru are five-year programs. So with two additional years, a student can receive what would be the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. And even at that time, Neil's vision was to begin to offer online classes. And we were doing that, but we were doing that at a master's level. We opened a, a program uh, with just two emphasis, expository preaching and biblical counseling. And... Um, we're doing that online, but our undergrad classes were all in person. And then in March of 2020, as in most of the rest of the world, everything went online. And so for the first time, I, God really uses all of our experiences. I laugh with my one granddaughter. She and I finished our master's degree at the same time. It only took me 50 years more than it did her. <laughs> she just went straight and I took not one gap year, but 50. But anyway, God used that as experience as an online student to help me to be aware of what it was like and what I liked in the way people taught, how to better interact. Because you really have to adapt your courses and to teach in a, in a much different way. And so that recent experience was something that God used because I taught one week in person and then during the week it was, from now on you're online. And I'm, I'm on what? <laughs> But um, we've done that since that point, and that first semester was really hard. But gradually, since we had more prep time, we were able to make that transition. The classes are usually quite small, but last year the, they allowed uh, women to audit the Women's Ministries course. So instead of the 12 regular full-time students that were signed up, I had 50 women in this class, including women from Brazil, from provinces in Peru, from the US. And um, that was really good. And part, one of the things that helped was even for these, many of these women who were auditing, who just felt they didn't have the time or maybe that they were too old to go back to school. But many of them were women who either were pastor's wives or who were involved in ministry. So they really had a lot to contribute just from what God had done in their own lives. And these are from some of the younger ones that were teaching a woman's Bible study for the first time online when they weren't used to doing that either. I'd like to have you meet a few of our other students. Ruben recently graduated with his master's degree in expository preaching, and he's now teaching at our seminary. But his profession is in the area of information technology, so he's been our go-to person, both as teachers and for students when we don't know how to fix the tech problem. This, this is Ruben, contact him. And he's been a big help in that area as well. But he and his wife, Yuli, were recently commissioned by their home church to start a daughter work in another area of Lima. When Lucho and Rosa graduated from seminary, he served as assistant pastor, I'm talking quite a few years ago because Neil was still there, in Chacaria, but they since have gone on to start a daughter work in another area called Chorrillos. But they've had an especially significant ministry of working with hurting couples whose marriages were broken. And they've been working on their master's degrees in biblical counseling and have really felt that what they have learned has been a real help to them in this is, this is their young adult, well, their couples um, group from their church at this point. Well, this was probably two years ago, just before COVID as well. Many of our graduates serve the Lord as missionaries in different parts of Peru. Biki works in Chinchil with women and children. It's a little village high in the Andes Mountains. Roberto and Sarela 
work in children's ministries in the jungle city of Tarapoto. They do some evangelistic events in parks and things like that, but they mostly partner with churches for their own special events, and they also train within the local church, training in how to evangelize and to disciple children. We do have graduates who are missionaries in different countries around the world, including Mozambique, where Victor and Gildeni are, Spain, India, Ivory Coast, Bangladesh. We even have some here in the USA. So we're really thankful for God, how God has used many of our graduates uh, in a growing way throughout the world. Then uh, the third area of ministry would be the prenatal center. And in February of 2022, just before I came to the US this time, we celebrated our 23rd anniversary by introducing Life and Hope Ministries, which is really an umbrella organization. It includes the prenatal center, which has now been going for 23 years, but the Life and Hope Biblical Counseling Center and New Life Publications, which is kind of like a little bookstore. It publishes a few things, but has other books available. And basically, it's recognizing something that has already occurred at the center. Because over the years, the counseling area of the center has expanded to include much more, not just women faces, facing a crisis pregnancy or maybe a forced abortion, abortion trauma, but for many years, we've offered premarital counseling, marital counseling, family counseling of different kinds. And uh, we've had some men come, but not very many. Then during the pandemic, we couldn't do anything in person, so we were counseling with Zoom or over the phone. But we were getting more and more calls for things like anxiety, depression, things that, you know, just as it was in other parts of the world, and more and more men that were doing the calling. And so now what they are doing is they're linking the counseling center, uh, opening up to, a wide, to all different areas of counseling. It will no longer just be counseling that is related to pregnancy and linking that to the seminary program in that the students in the counseling program at our seminary will be able to come and do their supervised practical sessions here at the center and it won't be limited just to certain areas of counseling, but they'll be able to expand that and to, to do all types of counseling as well. My main ministry has been within just the prenatal center itself, which would be like a crisis pregnancy center. And the idea is that a woman facing a crisis pregnancy or a difficult family situation can come to the center for counseling. We have some medical assistance, although we've not been allowed to do that at all uh, since COVID. They were just able to start again in January, I think, as far as any medical assistance. And then we also have um, classes on different types of ab abuse or uh, classes for women who family, raising families and things like that. So I would say that in general though, our goal is not just that a woman may come to know Christ and decide to either keep her baby or allow that baby to at least live and be adopted, but that she would become an active part of a Bible-believing church and grow to the point where she could use her experiences to help others. One other thing that uh, has really grown during the time of the pandemic is the use of bright course videos. We now, in Spanish, have available 70 videos uh, related to pregnancy or early parenting up to the first two years. And so we were able to put that online and women could get on and watch these videos on, either on their phone or on, their, on a computer. And then when we had the counseling time, we could relate to something they had already seen uh, and gave us more of a focus to be able to, if it was a woman who did not know the Lord, then we could focus on that. If it was a woman who was a believer but needed other help, uh, we could work with her in discipleship, and we do have uh, a list of other churches to whom we can refer them. But during the time of the pandemic, we were very limited and, and having to do a lot more of that ourselves rather than church referrals as much. Uh, Marlene Taillido, seen here, was once a client herself. And she's now the director of the center, and she's the one who's heading up the program for the volunteers. But another thing that she did during the time uh, of that we were restricted because of COVID, 
we, when we were doing counseling, especially as she would teach classes on abortion and things, almost all the information that she had was USA based. So she took a lot of her time to research just even newspapers locally and within Latin America to get up to date statistics and trends and movements and all those things throughout Latin America. And now she has co-authored this book called La Verdad del Aborto, The Truth About Abortion. And it's now one of the courses that all our volunteers must take. But it not only combines a biblical Pers uh, viewing abortion and pro-life themes from a biblical perspective, but it also has a lot of statistics and up-to-date information um, from a Latin American perspective, and it's a, a lot more focused on what the people there would, related, would be related to. But if you know of a pro-life ministry that has something in Spanish, I think this would be a very effective tool for them. At the um, prenatal center, I do. I serve on the board. Sometimes I work as a, I go uh, as a weekly volunteer. Sometimes as in reception. Sometimes in counseling. But the emphasis of my ministry there at the prenatal center has been in training and in teaching classes. And these again are pre-pandemic pictures, but. Um, an idea of one of the courses that I teach is the same one I was using with the ladies group, uh, the story of hope. And one comment that I've gotten from several of these women as we go through it is, I knew those Bible stories, but before it was kind of like the idea of putting them together, it was kind of like putting together a, a puzzle without having the picture on the top of the box. And how this study allowed them to just see how all of those stories linked together to really make one big redemptive story and uh, just how it all, it, it gives a complete vision for someone who doesn't have much Bible background and who doesn't, uh, the first half of it focuses on characteristics of God, how we see God through the Bible and as we go into the New Testament, how we see Je what we learn about Jesus in the Bible and they have a much more complete understanding when you see Christ died for your sins, well who is Christ and what, what difference does it make that he did that if you don't have a foundation in those things. Sometimes they just don't have understanding of what we're talking about. And so uh, just working with them in this training and understanding and, and I think growing for them. And then as we work more in the discipleship area of it, um, one of the things that we practice with them is even sharing their own faith story in a way that's understandable to other people. As we're in a, one example, in a Catholic country, if you say to someone, have you received Christ? Of course, I receive him every Sunday when I go to the Mass, because that's the terminology that they use, at least in Spanish. Um, when they go to the Mass to, to receive communion, they, that's what they say, I receive Christ. So even the words that we use and the concepts that we express, to learn to be able to share that in a way that is meaningful and understandable in the context in which we are. We use that time to memorize many new verses. Uh, we also use it to pray for one another. And one of the things that we've been emphasizing in that prayer time for each other is that God would lead each of us to another woman in whose life he would have us to invest our lives and to be intentional about it, that God would just give us direction um, and that we would really be willing to invest in that other person. And then I also teach classes which are not just for volunteers, but they're open to clients or if we have room even to people from uh, local churches, which most of these classes would have as their emphasis in terms of uh, things that are related to marriage and to the family. And I just really feel like it's such a tremendous need because the family is the basis of society. And our world is suffering today because people either don't know and understand the biblical concepts of family, or if they do know, then they're rejecting them and not following them. And it's a, a, a topic that really needs to be emphasized today. The second verse of that song, Find Us Faithful, says, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us. Let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. First, I'd like to ask you to stop and think, who has invested spiritually in your life? Is there someone who took the time, who made the effort, but who's really had an influence on your life? And then 
have I ever thanked that person? Have I ever not only just realized how much they invested in me, but let them know what a difference they made in, in my life and encourage them. But stepping on beyond that, um, are you intentionally investing your life in the life of at least one other person? I would say if you have children, that's the best place to start. Mm -hmm. And the last verse of this song says, after all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become a light that leads them to the road we each must find. And that's my, been my personal experience. God has honored the faithfulness of my parents. And as I think of how God is using my siblings and I today, uh, as of today, there's a pastor, a pastor's wife, a missionary, a deacon, Sunday school teachers. But part of that, the instruments that God used was godly parents and a godly church. And each of you can be a part of one of those things. So that's the main challenge I would like to leave you today. Are you intentionally investing in them? Or what are you investing in? I think a lot of people, what do you want for your children? Well, I want them to have a good education. I want them to have a good career. I want to leave them a generous financial heritage. But how many people are going to say, and those are good things, I'm not saying they're not good things, but how many people are saying, I want to leave, heart, leave uh, for my children a heritage of a love for God and for his word, of a heart that seeks to serve others, and of a desire to use their gifts and abilities to contribute to the well-being of the body of Christ. Is that your focus? Is that your intention? The most important thing that you can leave to your family. But your children aren't the only people in whose lives you can have an influence. Um, I think of these girls that were in a class that I had, and the reaction of many of them when I shared about my family was, well, I don't have a family that's anything like that, you know. And I stop and think, well, my dad didn't either. Uh, he was the first believer in his family. And, you know, that, that chain, I'm not saying your kids are going to automatically know the Lord or follow him or serve him, but that chain of influence begins with someone. And if you don't have that kind of heritage, ask the Lord to use you to start that kind of a chain. That your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can say, I know someone who knew and loved God and his word and was faithful to him. And I want that for my life. And he can use you for that. It doesn't have to be your children. It can be other people, too. Since I do work with women, I find Paul's instruction in Titus 2 to be a helpful pattern to follow, where he says that the older, more mature women should teach the younger women. But it's interesting that this instruction isn't sit them down and give them a lecture. It's living life with them. It's seeing how to apply biblical principles to our daily lives and our daily living and our relationships with other people. And it's a lot easier to just sit down and go through a book. But what people really need is someone to walk alongside them. That may give you a basis to talk, a starting point from which to work. But this kind of discipleship and investment, one, I think it, we often are not intentional. We think, if, oh, if I just live right, my kids are going to watch or other people are going to see and it's just going to happen. But when you're, if you're a teacher, this is what I want my children to learn. And to get there, I have to have these goals and methods and all those things. So if I notice this characteristic, what are important verses for them to learn? What are important Bible stories for them to read? What are things that we need to work on together and experience for them to have victory in this certain area of their lives? And just so often, I think that that intentional part, we neglect within our own families, maybe even more than with other people. And so I would say that's important. But then um, just that challenge that if you have grown in the Lord, if you've had the experience of knowing God, of being in his word, of talking with him in prayer, of just experiencing this relationship with Christ, are you asking God to help you to be an instrument in his hands in the life of another specific person so that they can experience that same thing? And that's a real challenge that I would like to leave with each of you today. Maybe 
if just the prayer of your heart would be, Lord, I want those who come behind me to know and to love you. And if that is a prayer of your heart, part of what goes along with that is knowing that he wants to use you to make that happen. He puts people in each of our lives. And you can't do that for the whole world, but you can do it at least in the life of one person and in many cases in the life of several people. Join me in a prayer just very briefly first, please. Heavenly Father, you have proved yourself so faithful to us. May we truly reflect your image in this dark and suffering world. May your Holy Spirit work in our lives and help us to be faithful to you. Amen. Sandy has a table out there and uh, feel free to visit with her and find out more. Interesting life to hear all the different things that have occurred in Peru and so we're going to stand and sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. 666. I don't have to say it now. They put it on the screen. <clears throat> My Jesus, I love Thee. I know Thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorn on thy brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now third is the last I'll love thee in life I will love thee in death and praise thee And say when the death do lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And don't forget to welcome uh, Travis and Ton into our family and the rest of their kids too. For that matter, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we're so grateful for your love, for the way that you care for us. We pray that you would help us to reach out because of your love and because of our love for you, both to our brothers and sisters to care for them, but to others who don't even know you yet, that you would help us to be aware, to be ready, to give an answer to every man for the hope that lies in us. Lord, one day we will walk through the gates of glory. We'll have endless joy and delight forever with you. But until then, help us to keep our eyes on you, to be ever ready to, to serve you. And Lord, to leave even today, looking at you and saying, Lord, whatever you want, I want to serve you. I love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Dismissed.